Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, as, as, as Rupert said, I'm, I'm going to talk um, a, a bit about um, object-based audio. Um, but, but before I start, start, just so I can get an idea of some people will have heard of object-based audio and probably use it. I know a couple of people in here do use it. Who's, who's heard of it before? So about half the people. So I'm going I'm to kind of explain the concept of object-based audio, of, of what it is and why it is. Um, so uh, hopefully by the end of it, everyone will be really clear and um, will understand what object-based audio is. But as Rupert said, my background is, is uh, at the BBC. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today um, stems from my work there stems from understanding object-based audio in the context of broadcasting. However, some of the examples I'm going to talk about um, of stuff that I've done since leaving the BBC um, are not broadcasting applications. They're kind of uh, um, experiential things, content experiences. But initially, to start off, we'll talk about um, what, what, what broadcasting is and what is broadcasting. Maybe is it worth turning? Can, I, can you see the... the uh, is that better? Mm. <clears throat> so <clears throat> it was fairly simple in, in the olden days. Um, you had a microphone, you had a stick on a hill, you had a radio receiver, and radio receivers kind of all looked quite similar. They were, they were small wooden boxes with loudspeakers and uh, amplifiers inside. And primarily your main concern, and Rupert can correct me if I'm wrong, is don't, don't blow up the stick on the hill in the middle and hopefully things will be all right. Um, it was mono. Uh, everyone's in here, everyone in here is familiar with like mono, stereo, terms like that, great. Um, and of course, everyone listened to the radio like that in the olden days, didn't they? That's how people consumed audio content. In, in, uh, they all kind of neatly sat around almost as if posing for a photograph. Um, uh, but actually, we know that that was a myth, really. And actually, it, when you think about consumption of audio content today, it's a complete myth. Um, and broadcasters, um, the, the, the world over, have gotten into the habit that's been dictated by previous um, uh, listening conditions and this assumption that there is a single type of person that you're targeting and they're all listening to the same thing and they're all listening in the same environment and they're all using the same wooden box but we know that's kind of nonsense um, you can you can get audio content played on you know you can buy a toaster now that plays the radio so actually the, the devices that are capable of creating audio are massive and diverse and hopefully everyone here can agree that the concept of broadcasting, not necessarily just broadcasting, any, any kind of final rendering of an audio file, um, whether that's on a CD or a, or a tape machine or whatever, um, that, 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 that concept, we are, we are making a compromise. And hopefully we can all agree that there's a, there's a compromise being made. Um, we can't guarantee that people um, will be listening in an environment like where the content's been created. I'm sure you guys, uh, I don't know if there are students here doing like audio or, or sound degrees. Are there people here? You, you, I suspect you're probably taught when you're mixing stereo to mix it on these great speakers, um, but always kind of just check on some crappy tinny things that, that it still sounds okay. And that's the compromise that you're making. You're going, well, we're going to affect we're going, to, we're going to affect the main mix for the people who are getting this amazing hi-fi experience just by tweaking it so that we know it works on these, uh, on these small tinny speakers. So we have no control. But technology kind of moved on since then. And, and the, the big question around object-based audio that we're kind of asking ourselves is if we knew the environment where the content was being consumed, if we know it's a, in a home cinema, really flashy home cinema with lots of speakers dotted all over the place, or if we knew the, the environment that it was being consumed in, maybe someone's on a bus listening on some uh, cheap, cheap um, in-ear headphones. And, and then it gets a bit more controversial and, I think, to my mind, a bit more interesting. If we knew the, some personal information about the person who is consuming the content, like what their likes are, what they're interested in, maybe 
um, we, we could know information about how, uh, how strong hearing they have, what their preferences are for different mixes um, and different interests, then maybe we can use that information about the, the system they're using, the environment that they're in, and their, their person, that, who they are and what they're like, to adapt the audio and change the audio in a way that enhances the experience and makes it better for them. And to a certain extent, that this is happening already with web design. Put your hand up in here, um, who's heard of responsive web design? So some people know what responsive web, well, responsive web design is, when you visit a website and you look at that website, it will be presented to you differently depending on the device that you're using to look at it. Look at it. So it, you get an optimized experience depending on the size of the screen that you're using. Um, and this, it's been extended, so actually you can get an optimized experience depending on where you're looking or when you're looking. So gradually these concepts of personalizing an experience are happening beyond just kind of recommendations they are happening. So the question is, what happens if we start applying that to sound and we start applying that to audio? Um, and this is where this concept of object-based audio content comes in. And it, it's the idea that rather than delivering a finished stereo file or a finished 5.1 file, you're delivering in a, what is, could essentially be described as a set of audio assets, audio objects, could we call them, and some accompanying metadata that kind of describes how those things should be reassembled. And those things are then reassembled in the device that's playing the content back. And actually, that reassembly can be done now because computing power has come on quite a long way since then. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, spatial audio because one of the big advantages of object-based audio is the, the ability to render it to whatever system you're using. Um, and um, one of, the, one of the, the key ways that we kind of listen to sound now is, is using headphones. And some of this stuff is kind of interesting when you, when you start um, considering how much of the population are using headphones to listen to content. So, but first, I'm going to ask a question that I kind of ask whenever I'm speaking to rooms of audio geeks. Put your hand up if you've got a 5.1 system, a surround sound system in your living room. That's OK, a couple of people. Now, keep your hand up if you've got that system set up to the ITU recommended distances and place, places. Normally, Rupert's the only person with his hand up at this point. But actually, Prin at the back, <laughs> he's got his hand up as well. So that's two people in a, in a room that I would argue is pretty slanted towards the audio geeks. So. That is representative of the, of the country as a whole, oh, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it's absolute. It's a compliment. <laughs> so, Ambisonics, yeah, okay? I don't want to use 5.1. No. Okay, we can, we, can, we can argue about that later. <laughs> um, but, 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 yeah, so, um, so, actually, not many people have surround sound for one reason or another. And um, it... Whether whether 5.1 or 7.1 or 9.1 or whatever dot whatever you want to talk about has been successful as a commercial product, whether Ambisonics has been successful as a commercial product, we you know there's 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 a pretty clear answer to that. I mean, surround sound has been successful in certain arenas, like so when you talk about cinema, when you talk about cinema theatres, where you've got a very very controlled listening environment, it's been quite successful. But when you're talking about delivering audio content to the masses, although, yeah, sure, DVDs quite often have got a, a Dolby surround mix, um, how many people are hearing the actual Dolby mix? Or how many people are hearing a, a downmixed version or a stereo version? Most people are hearing a stereo or downmixed version. Those who are hearing a 5.1, apart from two people in this room, are hearing a corrupted 5.1 because their speakers are in the wrong place. So a bit, a bit, a bit about how we, how we hear. Um, when a sound is created in a space, obviously, unless it's directly above us or in front of us, the sound arrives at one or other ear at slightly different times, and the sound arrives at one or other ear at sli slightly different levels as well, because it's had to travel a bit further. It's had to travel around our heads. Um, and those, that kind of the, the interaural level and interaural time difference 
are two really important cues that we use to be able to say, that sound is coming from over, over there or that sound is coming from behind us. And they're, and they're, um, they're kind of evolutionary subconscious reactions so that we know to jump out the way of the saber-toothed tiger that's about to pounce on us. There are other cues as well. So um, it's very, very rare that you'll listen to audio in, a, in an environment where there are no reflections. Probably the closest anyone's come to that is when they're out in the snow and the snow's really deep and it's really absorptive. Um, you pretty much, you've always got a surface near you and in here we've got lots of surfaces near us that is reflecting sound. So we don't really hear sound um, without reflections. Of course, the other place, I don't know if anyone's been in an anechoic chamber before, a couple of people in here might have been in one. It's, it's, if, you, if you're in a proper anechoic chamber, it's kind of an unnatural and quite uncomfortable place to be. Um, because we are literally not hearing any sound other than that that our body is making. And normally it's through our head. So you can hear, your, you can hear the blood pumping around your ears in, in a decent anechoic chamber. So where, where, there are, where there are surfaces, sound that reflects off the surfaces is delayed slightly and it's, and it's chained slightly. Um, and, and it's all of these things that we kind of use to be able to to detect what direction sound is coming from. So these reflections kind of really help. Um, and I don't know if anyone's seen one of these before, dummy head. So this is how we capture um, binaural, native binaural recordings, pretty much, using one of these Neumann dummy heads. And the, the fact that it looks like um, some kind of vaguely human head shape isn't by accident. Um, that, that shape was arrived at by a lot of testing and a lot of averaging. So we've, we've got kind of, apparently, that is an average human head. I'm not sure how many people you know look like that. But, um, but it kind of comes back to, comes back to this idea of uh, broadcasting being a compromise, really. The binaural signal that comes out of that dummy head is a compromised binaural signal. Unless you've got a head... So if you do know, or do have a friend that has a head exactly that shape, um, and, you, and you play them back a recording that was done on that dummy head, and you clamp their head so they physically can't move their head, they're going to get a really, really good experience, questionably, because you've just clamped their head still. But actually, but actually um, to listen to binaural um, and to, to, to discuss with anyone how good a binaural experience was um, is a really tricky thing to do because of those things that I was talking about before, about all of your, the shape of your head. And, and you think about um, us using our brains to detect a sound that's over there. The, the time of arrival and the, the uh, level of arrival and phase of arrival, if it's a low frequency, they're, they're all really important cues. And actually, just by slightly changing the distance between, those, between your two ears can radically change the difference between the two signals. So that, that's a complete compromise, that head shape. And some people, you'll talk to about binaural and they'll be really down on it and they'll say, uh, it's, I've never heard a good binaural recording in my life. They just don't work for me. Um, and that's because you've got an unaverage head, if that happens to you. Whereas some people who've heard stuff on this and thinks it sound great, well, perhaps they've got a more a head shape that's more similar to that. So, um, so, re so a native binaural recordings like this are kind of interesting, and um, I did a project um, with Aloise, who sat in here, um, last year where we did some binaural recordings of, um, of a drama called Stone Tape that was on uh, Radio 4. Um, using the dummy head, you might recognise some of the actors' faces in this photograph. But again, th these, these people are performing around the dummy head. We were also using a couple of other microphones as well to record what they were doing. But... But um, if, if you kind of position yourself where that head is, you'll know that, that, uh, that Julian Barrett, who's this actor here, would be coming from that direction, from your head. But the way that you localise sounds when you're, when you're externalising them using binaural isn't just about that single sound source and how it, how it comes to those ears. Actually, when you hear a sound source, you, you will be moving your head slightly all the time and all those subtle movements will subtly change the signals at your left and your right ear. And those will, build, those will confirm where that sound is coming from. And actually, if you think about it, that's kind of important when we're listening to sounds that are directly in front of us or behind us. Because if there's a sound 
directly in front of us, actually the signal arriving at our left and right ear, if we've got a quite symmetrical head, are exactly the same signal. So we have to kind of move around a little bit, and that's what tells us that it's coming from there and not there and not there and not behind us. So it's, it's, it, it, it's the, 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 the idea of native binaural is kind of interesting, but actually quite limiting because you can't personalize it and you can't react to head movement. And head movement's really important when you're, when you're recording sound. So, um, so I'm, I, I think binaural is great, and there are a lot of people that use it really well, a, a native binaural, but it has some massive, massive drawbacks when it, comes to, when it comes to kind of creating really immersive experiences. And that's where I come to kind of explaining what um, object-based audio is. So, I kind of do this with a, with a really wide angle shot for this section. So imagine this is our sound scene. And within that sound scene, there, there, are, there are fundamentally two sources. There's um, an ex-colleague of mine, Chris Pike, on the left-hand side with his uh, double bass. You'll be glad that this is a still image and not the audio. Um, and then there's me playing on a, on a guitar on the left-hand side. Um, and traditionally, if we're going to... If we're gonna, oh, the other, it's not a source, it's debatably, it's not a source. The other really important factor of the, in this image um, that contributes to the audio experience is what? Anyone? The, yeah, the room, the a, a characteristic of the, of the room, the, the reverb. So if we're creating a stereo mix of that, I think the, the best kind of visual um, analogy to that is we're. Two, two spots into which we kind of mix a balance of the sound in the left and right hand side, and that's rendered, and that's our stereo file. So that's kind of our stereo mix. Um, ambisonics has been mentioned in here. Kind of the ambisonics version of that, depending on, depending on how you represent it, it's, 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 it's a bit different, okay? You're capturing the whole sound scene, depending on the, the whether you use like a B format or a higher order ambisonics, you are representing the whole scene from this point in space by capturing spherical harmonics. Um, and the big difference between ambisonic and ambisonics is kind of interesting because, to a certain extent, it's uh, it's it's format agnostic. You can playback agnostic, to a certain extent. Um, Object-based audio. The difference here now is actually what we're going to do is we're going to represent that sound as a set of audio objects and some metadata describing where those audio objects are in space, where they are in time, how loud they are. And in this scene, we, we probably would break that down into um, a me audio object, a Chris audio object, and a the room audio object. And actually, maybe, maybe you'd use ambisonics as a format for one of those objects. Maybe you'd use stereo as a format for one of those objects. Maybe you use a mono recording as one of those objects. Um, the, a, a big advantage of of uh, object-based audio over other kind of format agnostic things like ambisonics is the level of, of uh, personalization you can do. So I could recombine that scene in a completely different way if I have those audio objects, completely different way. It doesn't need to be from the same point in space. So I've kind of talked a little bit about what is an audio object um, by saying, well, maybe it could be an ambisonic maybe a representation of a source, maybe it could be a mono, a stereo. Um, the question kind of comes, well, is it, are we just sending every single microphone feed? This was a recording I did with some of the players from the Philharmonic, where um, it was a test recording, so you can recognize a few uh, mics up there. There's a, there's a, you can see the Neumann head, and there's a stereo mic behind the Neumann head. We've got some close mics on these uh, three string players. Um, that, that thing in the middle is a is a 360-degree camera lens or a 180-degree camera lens. Um, and right at the back, slightly almost off camera, there's a thing called Marvin. Has anyone heard of that? It's a, um, I think it's an eight-channel spherical microphone array. Um, so in that, in that circumstance, maybe we could send every mic feed. Well, there's probably about 10 mic feeds there, so that's, that's manageable in terms of... Uh, broadcasting bit rates or fitting it in a file and uh, streaming it online. But think of the problems. How many mics do you think there are on a problems recording? Any guesses? 550? There's over 150 microphones. I actually circled all of them in there. You can kind of just about see them. 
And if you look in the middle, you can see there's like a Hamasaki square in there, which is a, a surround sound mic technique. Um, that massive ugly thing right in the middle was the one that the director hated me for rigging because that's a sound field microphone and they're quite chunky big things right in the middle at the top there. And then loads and loads of clo close microphones, a number of curtains that run across. In this circumstance, in fact, I've got a close, close up of the Hamasaki square going up um, in the proms. Um, and these, these mic arrays are uh, um, about capturing the room, the capturing the kind of acoustic quality of the Royal Albert Hall. Um, much to the complaints, actually, of a lot of the, the sound engineers, because they don't like the sound of the Royal Albert Hall. <laughs> um, um, but uh, but um, it, it's impractical for you to go, right, well, let's take all those 200-odd microphones and let's stream all of those, and then we can render them, because actually it's quite intensive to render that many audio files. That's a lot of audio data to be kind of chunking up and broadcasting. So the question come, comes back to, well, what is an audio object then? And, and, and really, the, the best answer I've, I've been able to come up with, and I've just finished a PhD in this, is an audio object is, is whatever it needs to be. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a chunk of uh, audio data and some accompanying metadata, and that is defined by the ambition of the content creator. So the content creator wants to make an experience, and the experience that they kind of want to create um, will determine how many audio objects are required. So if, if a content creator says, I want to make an audio experience, but my audio experience is going to be a, a mono um, recording of the orchestra through a, through, and you know the only people who are going to listen to it I know are going to be people listening on kitchen radios, then essentially you can, you can use a, a mono audio object as your whole thing and it's just one audio object and that's fine. Um, but if you want to create um, a, an interactive orchestral experience where uh, I can go and sit next to the first violinist and hear what it sounds like from there, or I can go to the back of the hall and hear what it sounds like right at the back, you're going to need a, a larger number of audio objects, a larger number of channels or assets. Um, but essentially, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, a technical and creative decision that has to be made. Um, I'm going to talk about two projects now that I've done, which have kind of involved this kind of audio object-based content. The first one is a project I did with um, BBC Philharmonic, where um, we created a... This was while I was at the BBC, uh, working with an external company. We created a uh, conduct-your-own-orchestra um, experience, uh, where you could control the speed, and you can control the level of the orchestra. We actually made this um, in ambisonics, rendered on a, on a six-speaker uh, array. And it used a Microsoft Connect, don't know if anyone remembers those, to detect hand positions. Um, the, the Connect was our input device, and it detected how quickly you were conducting this orchestra, and it detected how you know, whether you were making really big movements or really small gestures. Um, and then based on that, um, rendered the audio. There's a recording of the test shoot that I did. So we filmed it as well with a really uh, wide angle lens. This was recorded at the BBC in Manchester. This building no longer exists now. It's now a car park. Um, but um, they, the Philharmonic, although they had their old rehearsal room locked down, they had a really nice new one at Media City um, built. Um, and this was when we recorded the kind of final version. Um, I don't know, has anyone worked with orchestras before? Um, dep depending on who you work with, they can be either very, very friendly and very flexible or very um, interesting and traditional <laughs> to work with. Um, but actually, the guy, we worked with a really good conductor who was, who actually, we were, I was really nervous about saying, we need to kind of put a camera where you stand and conduct your orchestra. Um, and he was so nice and so kind of amenable to letting us stick this 4K camera right in the middle. Um, and then uh, the orchestra uh, all kind of dressed up for us in different, different colors. Um, and it went into the Manchester International Festival um, where, as this kind of interactive installation, and it tracked your, tracked your movements. 
And I've got a video, I think, somewhere to show it in action. Maybe. <laughs> So these kind of test videos when we were setting up and calibrating it for the Manchester International Festival. And of course, it's William Tell because you've got, you know, you have to do William Tell. So that, that was an example where um, it was actually an ambisonics um, signal that we were that we were mixing with some close mics to get the kind of really close control of the level, and then we had the ambisonics to give us a kind of spatial envelopment and, and immersion. And it did all right, won some awards and stuff, which was good. Um, but um, but um, the project I'm going to talk about a bit more now is, is one that I did um, pretty much a year ago. Um, I've, 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 uh, this project was, was, was approached in, in a kind of a, a storytelling way, and I've kind of got a few slides to talk about stories, which I think I'm going to whiz through, really, because... A lot of the a lot of the um, audio object based audio research has been centred and concerned around um, spatial audio. I think it's fair to say, and uh, generating really immersive spatial audio experiences. Um, and actually, for me, it gets it gets a, a lot really really interesting when you start applying it to storytelling. And actually, rather than just thinking about positions and rendering to um, loudspeaker layouts, what happens when you start talking about unpacking um, stories and, and repacking stories in different ways. So it, it kind of led to some discussions about what makes a good story and how important character is and narrative formats. And I kind of landed on these narrative structures and actually, this is probably a better slide. There are some there are some kind of different narrative structures to how you how you can tell um, interactive stories. I mean, if people are familiar with the Choose Your Own Adventure books that kind of are quite old things, but th th these are kind of methods of storytelling in a non linear way. And I did some work on kind of how you could break down stories and uh, recombine those stories in different ways, thinking about audio objects and thinking about how we can break down audio objects. Um, and, and it kind of resulting in having to, having to give writers constraints. Um, I'm, not, I'm not going to talk too much about this. Some of these projects um, I, can, I can really recommend you going to, to look at more. So this was while I was at BBC R&D, and there was a project they did on uh, Derek Tangi, um, which was a, uh, an audio documentary that... Um, that changed duration, and you could change the duration of it dynamically in, in real time because it was assemble, an assembly of all these different assets and the different metadata. And I don't, I'm not going to talk about that in too much detail today, but it was the last project I was involved with at the BBC, but I like, completely recommend that you go away and kind of look up uh, Derek Tangi at BBC R&D, and it's a really interesting project. But the, the one I am going to talk about is a project I did last year um, um, in uh, at MoMA in New York, Björk, um, and this was a this was kind of um, it, it took the it took a combination of these kind of storytelling ideas and the spatial audio ideas um, to try and create a um, an audio a storytelling audio experience. Um, you remember at the beginning I was talking about binaural audio and how important that head movement is to, to be able to kind of externalise audio sources. Well, this project um, that, that used one of these. Has anyone seen one of these before? It's a little... Um, this, the, this photograph is probably about that big. Um, and they clipped on top of uh, a set of headphones and it basically tracks your orientation. It's kind of, I think there's some accelerometers inside. Um, and it connects by Bluetooth to um, um, a, a mobile device. So it can, do this, it can do this head tracking. So it can tell you what orientation your head is in. Um, and it's a really small um, piece of kit um, with a battery and some accelerometers and a, and a Bluetooth radio in it, basically. Um, so we, we kind of used a combination of these 
um, to be able to detect in what, what direction your head was facing in order that we can actually, we can actually render the audio objects in real time um, <laughs> to give that externalization. So we can apply those kind of binaural panning based on head orientation. Yes, there's a question. Latency. Say again? Was the latency good the, enough? The latency was, wasn't ideal. Right. It was good enough for, for the application. No, sorry, the question asked was about the latency of your... Yeah, so uh, honestly, I can't, I don't know, I can't quote the latency. Um, there are other systems for this kind of head tracking which have far, far better latency that Did use... it work well enough? Or... It, it worked well enough for the application, but, in a, it, but the application was a museum exhibit with members of the public walking around in, in large groups. So um, I, I'd say... It worked well enough for that application, but if you're going to sit in a quiet room with one of these on and really critically listen, then you, then you know an experienced listener will be able to hear the latency. But it's it's pretty it's pretty it's no it's good it's fine, um, but but it's it's pretty good as as a Rondo head tracker and you can buy these things. It was a Kickstarter project. You can buy these things. And I think there's an app in an app store that will uh, that will play back your stereo files and externally render the Loud, loudspeakers in space like that. So you can put headphones on and it could be like you're in a studio listening to it on, on loudspeakers. That's the, that's the kind of idea. Um, but that's obviously limited because you're using stereo as a source material. So all you can do is externalize loudspeakers. Um, if, if you had content that was made using audio objects, you can obviously do a lot more because you can spatialize things all over the place. So this project used head tracking um, and uh, um, a few of us went out to do some recordings. I think I've got some recordings on here, actually, um, using, uh, you can see the dummy head. Chris is holding the dummy head. And then there's, um, um, was that a double MS mic in there? I think there was a double MS mic, a Schlepp's double MS mic in the, uh, in the, uh, um, that Eloise is holding in front. So the, the, um, the, the, the project that we were collecting sounds for was um, a career retrospective of uh, Björk's kind of previous eight albums. Um, and um, <coughs> we, we, recorded, we went out and recorded some sounds. Obviously, we used loads of her music. Um, and uh, we, we, um, we, Chris Watson, a wildlife recorder, got, um, gave us a load of uh, audio recordings that were actually made in Iceland as well. But some, some of the stuff we captured ourselves, um, and I'm from up in Manchester, we were kind of lucky enough on, um, on the day that we planned to record this to kind of be hit in various bit, parts of Manchester with the kind of Icelandic type weather. So we went out and recorded in the snow as well, which has got a really particular sound in the snow. So the, the, um, that recording there wasn't the recording that we made. That was the audio from the from the um, video recording. But it's but, but snow's got a really particular sound. I mentioned at the beginning. Actually, it's quite, so absorptive. It, it really creates a, a kind of surreal uh, sound, audio soundscape. Um, and uh, so this the, the idea behind the, um, the the retrospective was it was a this career retrospective that was based on a, on a story written by an Icelandic poet. Um, and it was in the physical space at MoMA in New York. And this is a, this is a kind of an early plan of what the shape of the exhibit looked like. Um, and you kind of walked through these different zones. Um, and each zone was um, representative of a, of a different album. 
and um, the, the way that the way that we kind of envisaged it working was as you moved between the different zones, the the uh, tracking technology. This isn't a head tracker. This is um, eye beacon technology to track your location in an environment. Would kind of tell you uh, where you were, where you where you were, how you were moving around. Um, that's kind of that's kind of what, what was what was created. I think originally the the, the concept was a, was a, a bit more ambitious to the point of being unachievable. Has anyone used um, these uh, uh, Bluetooth um, trackers before? Eye beacons, are called. Have you heard of them before? Couple people maybe use them. It's a it's just a Bluetooth beacon, um, and the the mobile phone detects that beacon and tells you how strong the signal is, basically. And we what we wanted to do is use triangulation, stick a couple of these things around, work out exactly where this phone is. Um, it's, everyone's wearing them around their neck, so we can work out exactly where, where we are. So in theory, we can create augmented audio by putting a source in a certain point in this space. And the th all the theory of that is absolutely brilliant and sound. Um, and when you, when you rig it with one person walking around a space with these... With these uh, um, eye beacons, it works. It's fantastic. And as soon as you get two people or three people, or in the case of a museum, really popular museum exhibit in MoMA, maybe 20 people, 30 people walking around a space, actually this Bluetooth technology um, is really affected by water and, you know, we as humans are effectively just sacks of water. So they, they massively interfered. The, the noise and the fluctuations in the signal on to the to the phones were was so significant that actually really the practically the best that we could do was to be able to go you are in this zone you're in that zone and actually even if you look so for example we've got zone zero on the left and zone two next to it there would be loads of errors saying this person has moved into zone two from zone zero and the only way we kind of avoided those errors was to put some logic in to say you can't go from zone zero to zone two without going through zone one so there, there was lots of kind of of of, of um stuff built into this to to uh, to make it stable and it, you know it works in the end not 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 to the scale not to the ambition we wanted to but it it, it worked in terms of being able to move you through this piece um and detect when you've left and be able to finish playing a particular zone and then move on to the next zone um we also um as well as the zone detection, we also had some uh, kind of Easter egg audio content that was hidden and attached to certain eye beacons around. So if you walked up close to one of these, you'd hear the sound of a volcano erupting or the sound of a geyser or, or what have you. So all of these as kind of separate audio objects um, that were spatialized using um, uh, binaural rendering by a company called Two Big Ears, who were really good. Um, I, early on in the project, I did a little video of how it might work, although we didn't do this in the end. But I'll play this video in now. Okay, so here's a quick video demonstration of how the uh, using eye beacon zones to trigger audio samples might work for the music. So a visitor who is green here walks towards the first zone, and in that zone will trigger an audio loop. As they walk into the next zone, at the appropriate time, that leap will switch. As they walk to zone 3, a different loop. So, so that kind of an idea of how you can kind of progress based on your physical space as you're moving through, you can progress through. Um, in, in the end, it didn't quite get to that level of granularity because as as with every project that ever happens, you kind of, you start off with great ambitions and they become more and more realistic over time. Um, but this is a this is in Stuttgart where we kind of rigged up a um, a um, a one-to-one um, -one -one scale map of the exhibit so that gives you an idea of kind of how big it was. Um, and then you can see on these uh, mic stands that are dotted around, the eye beacons attached to the top. That's what those, those things are. And that's how many we needed to just 
be able to tell if you're in a zone or if you weren't in a zone. So actually quite, quite a lot of them, given, uh, um, given, given the kind of the, the granularity, they kind of promise so much. And it was a bit disappointing, actually, to be honest, once you start realising physics gets in the way. Um, and this was a map of some of the hotspots, which had um, audio objects that were triggered as you kind of got close to them. They were triggered, and some of them kind of varied the level depending on how close you were. Again, that was noisy because depending on if there were people around you, it would kind of say you were closer so or not. What was the sensing mechanism? How, how do you mean? Oh, was it ultrasonic, infrared? Oh, so the Bluetooth. Radio. Yeah, Bluetooth technology is is a radio frequency. Effectively, it's a, it's a particular band. I'm not sure what the band is a radio frequency. So there's a radio, Bluetooth radio chip in in pretty much every mobile phone. Now, so we used iPod touches, and then these things, the, the, those things on the previous slide. So the beacons are presumably emitting. Yes, that's right. So the, the beacons, all the beacons do is emit a an identifier signal, and then your phone or your your kind of device will detect that identifier signal and the strength of the signal right. that, that's there. So it knows it know all your phone will know is this this uh, this ID is this strong. And then using a combination of a few of, you know, more than one piece of information, then it can start going. So the, so the I stands for ID, effectively. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's <laughs> I. What does what does I ever stand for? Intelligent? Maybe I don't know. <laughs> Good question. Interesting. I don't know. <laughs> Interesting. I oh, know. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's a radio frequency, and and it, and it used triangulation to work out work out. Or not triangulation. It used a combination of different signals to work out which zone we're in, accompanied by some logic, just to to um, to, to iron out some of the errors that we were getting at the beginning. So, from memory, I think it was one of the ones in the middle, um, and that was kind of built. On a, they in, in a moment they actually constructed a mezzanine floor for this thing to go on, um, and um, this is this obviously isn't the final design, but this is with all of the kind of walls in. And they were starting to, to build some of the stuff into it here. Um, and then obviously loads of testing. So these are the bank of the iPod touches with the headphones, with the um, these Rondo head trackers attached to the top of them. Um, um, thankfully, before all the people, we realized that these uh, the iBeacons weren't um, necessarily that reliable. And I've got a... Uh, and I've got a clip. So the way that this thing worked was, depending on which zone you're in, it would kind of progress you through the story and then trigger these additional kind of Easter egg uh, audio objects as you moved around. So um, that was kind of the uh, that was kind of the um, application that we created for the, the York thing. So ho hopefully um, that was kind of interesting and some some applications of um, object-based audio beyond just spatialization uh, to include kind of personalization and start thinking about kind of how, how it impacts narrative and storytelling. So I hope there are some questions now, if anyone's got any kind of questions about any of that stuff or concepts of object-based audio in general. Um, just uh, with, with that sort of uh, idea, would it work backwards? So if, um, if that person were to like if it was recognizing that the person was walking back through that, that track, would it would it recognize that? And, and we, yeah, so we thought we thought about that. We talked about that a lot at the beginning as to whether 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 we could do that. And I think in an ideal world, you built you 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 you'd have that flexibility in in the system. But there are there are a couple of there's a creative question there as to whether you want that whether that would be a meaningful experience to kind of rewind and go back to the previous chapter. Um, there is, there were, I mean, the, the practicality of the situation was there were hundreds of people trying to see this and hundreds of people trying to move through this. And the reality of the situation was people were kind of marched through in groups and they didn't turn around and go back. And, it, and it, you know, and it would be lovely for people to go in and savour it and explore because all of those... While there was a story in each of those zones, actually, the um, the narrative of that story ended at a certain point. It didn't go on forever, but the sound world continued in that space, and the Easter eggs continued. So you could go and interact with these objects, and and the the idea 
was, you know, people could spend half an hour in one zone if they really liked that album or... Yeah, that, was, reality, that was going to be my next question yeah, to see if it... The, the reality of the situation is people walk through at quite a pace, so they didn't turn around and go back and they didn't linger for a long time. At least my, my kind of observations of how people were moving through the exhibit. It was because it was, it was a popular show and, and there were lots of visitors. And MoMA, you know, MoMA's, MoMA needs to keep people, needs to keep visitors moving through their exhibit. Definitely. But, but it, that, that, that question brings up loads of really interesting ideas about storytelling and what it means to go backwards. And uh, so the, that, that, that variable length documentary that I mentioned earlier, um, th 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 that was approached at a much more kind of lower level narrative theory where you chunk up the story into different audio objects and you define the relationships between those audio objects and you define the dependencies between those audio objects. So, um, for example, you wouldn't, you wouldn't suddenly... So if, if, you were, if you were listening to the really short version to halfway through and then suddenly went, oh, I want a longer version and slowed it right down, you wouldn't so suddenly get a load of new characters introduced who you needed to know something about before, because that, from a storytelling point of view, just wouldn't make any sense. So there are lots of dependencies within that kind of storytelling which would say, don't introduce this person unless they've been introduced earlier on, or, or you know, in, in, in narrative theory, don't, 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 um, don't, don't answer this question unless there's a question been posed, or don't pose this question don't play this answer if the question hasn't been posed. Don't pose the question unless you're going to play the answer. So, so there are dependencies in both directions, really, that if there's a question asked at the beginning, then you need to answer that at the end, else you leave, you know, unfulfilled from a storytelling perspective. So in terms of this, in this, this data, the, the, the layers of data now that we're dealing with with audio objects are, are things like where is this sound coming from in space? They are... Um, uh, you know, is the sound moving around? It, it, there are some. There is there is some semantic layers there. Like, is this narration object? Is this um, is this a language object? Is it English? Is it French? What have you? But there's there are those layers, but there aren't there aren't kind of there isn't that layer of storytelling in terms of how does this sit within a the wider piece of con content. Various things. Um, I mean, the fact that you had trouble with the Bluetooth, I've just checked it out. It's 2.4 gigahertz. Yeah. And that's exactly the same. Because <clears throat> I tried doing musician location by using the time differences of diversity digital radio mics. Mm -hmm. And it worked great until there was an audience. Yeah. And then suddenly everything was absorbed. The audience is always ruin everything. <laughs> also, we do it inside <laughs> an inflatable sculpture. And I discovered that when they chell at the plastic, you get metallic stuff and, and yeah. well anyway i won't go down that road but i was interested in tool sets you're using for yeah um are you using sort of ambi based panners to do movements within uh, um, or so the the, the spatial for the for the Buick project mm. it was it was uh i don't know you might recognize reaper was up there um as the daw we love reaper reaper reaper's good um, we were working with a company called Klangerfinder, a German company, who... Have uh, they done that head tracking in-ear monitoring thing? Uh, I'm, I don't know, maybe. Um, uh. they're, they're, um, they're kind of closely linked to Volkswagen. They do lots of Volkswagen stuff. They're a sound design organisation that, that were that created the, the production plugin for Reaper that exported the metadata to be able to kind of render the to play these audio objects, um, we we um, worked with uh, two big ears for the panning. They're a they're a binaural rendering company that do quite a lot of stuff in VR now, um, and they were using I think it was um, Unity. No, it was a P PD plugin, a pure data plugin that, that was libpd in a in, a, in the iPod. App. You didn't bother to me measure anyone's heads as nope. they went in. You just used a standard yep. average. Yep. We didn't right. do any of that stuff. There's a Kickstarter campaign that's just 
um, that's, that's going on at the moment that uses that's, that's doing something which I haven't worked out what it's doing yet, but it's doing some sort of personalization. There were... Well, I, I always thought you could scan people's heads with the 3D scanner and get a, and then give it the correct. But I've never got around to doing it. Yeah, yeah I think. I mean, I do that all the way. So that's very recent. No, that is fairly recent. I think yeah, and I think there's a there's a lot of academic research mm. around pinna shape and. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I use Harpex quite a lot, yeah. do you know, and that's got at least sixty different binaural. Yeah, choosing from sixty different presets is not user friendly. <laughs> yeah. is that different? Do I care? But but that's yeah, but that's that's the problem. I mean, I talk to people who who don't write binaural at all, mm. and it's one of those things that's really difficult to have a have a, an objective conversation about because it's fundamentally it's an, a subjective experience. But there's you, people who don't hear stereo. Yeah. And it, it's almost a taught experience. You have to almost teach people what they're listening to because it's not... Oh, anyway, I, I, I won't go into it. But I, I'm interested about... The, because, I mean, your, your example with you and the double bass player in Chris, the room... Yeah. How would you approach that as a tool set? Would you have an impulse response of the room... Oh, and then so place, is that about rever reverberation? How do you do? And, how do you and place do reverb? your object within a three D impulse response, or what? I, I, I think I don't think that anyone's answered the question of how do you do object based reverb. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that question. I've got been, a couple of ideas, but yeah, I, 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 mean, I don't. I don't. I don't think. I mean, in, in that case, you haven't got even if you've just got a stereo microphone and one on each instrument, they're not totally independent, are they? Because the one microphone will hear the other instrument, yep. unless you're going to do them one at a time and then simulate the environment. Uh, yeah, but I, I would I'd, I'd bring that back to um, that, the point I made about what is an audio object, and unless you're unless you as a as a content creator said this experience, we need to be able to completely remove the double bass from this experience. Or add another player. Or, or add an, or yeah, if, if if that was your use case, then you would need to record it in a different way, or you'd need to process it in a different way to remove that double bass player. Yeah. Like with with narration, Rupert talks about quite quite a lot about issues with uh, intelligibility of of dialogue in a mix, and and actually to satisfy everyone, I don't think you need to be able to remove the narrative completely. You just need to be able to have some control over. Mm -hmm. Over the, the balance and maybe the accent. <laughs> I don't know how you do that. Well, also that's what I've found because when I do, I do quite a lot of ambi recording with spot mics, and what's the been the biggest learning cliff is what is actually really important to suggest reality to the listener, and what isn't important. And in fact, it's quite surprising which cues are important. And it, which, if I've got a spot mic on a fiddle with the sound field and uh, no, I, I time align the mics, but the impulse response that I had to the spot mic on the fiddle doesn't need to be the same as the room. It just needs to have the first reflections at the right place and a reasonable yeah, yeah. tail. And then the brain just ignores the rest of it and goes, oh, yeah, that works. It just listens to the first bit and goes, yeah. but that, that's what happens for me anyway. I don't yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, maybe turn the camera off for this bit. Though, though the proms recordings, uh, yeah, edit this bit out. <laughs> the proms recordings, um, when when most of the most of the surround sound mixes on the proms recordings are using artificial reverb from a from a box <coughs> in a in a in a room, they're not using <gasps> shock horror, <laughs> and it's, and it's and 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 and, and, that, and really. And it's it's kind of it's a really interesting debate when you talk about kind of trying to create what it's like. Be like, I mean, I've I've had lots of of producers come up to me and say, "Well, I want it to sound like you're there," and the response to that is, "No, you don't want it to sound like <laughs> no, you're there." No, no, no. <laughs> Actually, you want it to sound right, not. I mean, and there yeah. is not necessarily the right place. Yeah, it's it, the coughing and the, uh, <laughs> and the shattering. Yeah, and the yeah. You want you want. Hi, hi, Tony. Um, I concur completely, um, and just from experience of uh, mixing the the London Phil uh, on some recordings which I got as parts, 
from a multi-track recording from Air Studios, uh, but without any charts to tell where the microphones were placed. So I've got Decker trees, I've got coincident pairs, I've got MS going on, and a lot of spot mics. And I think what we've done is come to the same conclusion. You, you place things where, where you think they should be placed best, and then you, you have your reverb for the first reflection, and you create the ambience of the room that, where you think they should be. And you just, in sound designing like that, you either have sound field microphone, you position that and you accept that as your B format uh, interpretation and decode that, or you just use what you would do in a, in a stereo situation, any film, bed, stem, spot mics. Yep. And uh, that's as, as convincing as you can be. And that, that's one of the big challenges with um, virtual reality as, as, a, as a storytelling platform because um, because virtual reality is a step towards trying to recreate what it's like to actually be there, and and you know again it's the same response for me is do you actually want to you know do you want to recreate what it's like to actually be there and, and yeah and as soon as and as soon as you say to a someone who's who's used to using video to tell stories that now okay you can't have a close up and you can't have the <coughs> sweeping tracking shots um, they. They get, they get upset because you're taking tools away from them. So it's, it's, like, it's, a, it's a big question as to... But there again, there's a, the debate. I mean, I was doing a film recently where I was trying to simulate it. It happened, the, the story happened in, on the uh, World War I battlefront in Macedonia up in the mountains. And I made the decision at the very beginning, it didn't matter what camera angle or close up they used. I was just going to create a sound field of the barrage in the mountains and not move it. Mm -hmm. Because in fact, when I tried pissing around with it, yeah. it detracted from the film. It made, it made you feel almost queasy yeah. because the sound field's moving. And so I, I just left that sound field static and let the and, director do exactly what they yeah, want. And, and again, I mean, if you, if you, even if you just listen to stereo mixes on, on, on television with the over-the-shoulder like, over shots and stuff, mm. you, you, don't get, you don't get actors no. suddenly coming from different speakers. Um, you know, the most, the most you get on a stereo TV mix is the car driving off and you'll get a pan as the car goes off. But they're all kind of, uh, you know, artificial mix decisions that have been made. And, and that... And that concept of the moving sound field actually for me you know it, it only works when mm. the agent is the user so computer games when i'm when i'm walking around i want the sound to change as i'm walking around but actually if it's if it's a director cutting if it's someone else doing it and not me it's really disorientating anybody else have questions for tony Yeah. <laughs> so um, the the point is now. I was uh, checking the Chris Pike and Frank Mike your work, the recent work, and um, I was checking about binaural binaural rendering and uh, real time binaural rendering. So. What they are trying to do, as I understood, is they are trying to do the binaural rendering out from the surround, directly from the source, so from the streaming, like from the BBC, for example, yeah. like from the distributor, and after send it into stereo for headphone listening. Um, I, so I don't, I don't know. Where, um, the, 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 Chris and Frank do, you, call, you know, they'll do loads of, of binaural research in different projects. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know specifically. Um, which which project? Okay. But 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 binaural you can you can render to binaural in different ways. So you can render to binaural um, using native binaural recordings, which gives you all the kind of baked in differences between the, the levels. You can you can virtualize loudspeakers. So there was a unit called a Smith headphone realizer or something, which was a which which used used um, convolution reverberation techniques to virtualize loudspeakers and used some head tracking so you could you, you could literally use this 
this uh, kind of half rack unit and a and a set of headphones, and you 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 literally couldn't tell whether the sound was coming from the headphones or the speakers. If you're sitting in the room, you could, mm-hmm. you know, other than the fact you're wearing these headphones, that, that all of the audio, all of the signal differences are accounted for when arriving at your ears. So you can virtualize a surround mix or a stereo mix with virtual headphones, mm-hmm. or you can you can you can virtualize audio objects, which mm-hmm. aren't things mixed to a specific speaker location, uh, sources or assets, if you like. Because I was thinking now, like, the tools that we have right now are all channel-based, most of them. So, like, if someone... Are, I was thinking about this idea, uh, like, an electronic music producer that wants to do, like, a live set in surround, so you can actually do, like, a streaming, like, surround for headphones. You know what I mean? So, like... It's possible now, but the point is that you have to use like a 5.1, like yeah, so because it's channel based. So you can't really use yet an object based unless you are you have like a solution now. Um, well, so I think there were. Sorry. So you can, like you can pan left and right. You can have binaural panels. So you take a mono source, you just binaurally encode that. Yeah, but the point is with some environment. But the, the, the problem is that uh, the periphery is missing, so the height, still the height is missing in 5.1. Yeah, yeah. So you can, use, like the, you can use like a 9.1, you can use a higher, if, if, if you're just mixing, if you're going through the, this channel. Mm-hmm. But, but I guess the, you always come back to ask yourself who, who's the audience and how are they going to consume this content and how are they going to be listening because, because Actually, unless you've got kind of head tracked going on, it's really that the value of personally the value of height I think is quite questionable in binaural unless you're unless you're mm-hmm. tracking, you know, head position. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, but you can you can then build that into the encoding, and the advantage is that of course you've only got two output channels, and you can mix binaural signals. But it's static. It can't react to head movements. They're static binaural signals, so you lose. Right, except that you have to then have, if you're, if the old thing, the, deep, the final encoding would be in the in the application in the phone or the. So if you if you've got discrete sources that you want to pan and take head head head, uh, head movement into account, you have to do that at the receiver end, at the yeah. listener end. Yeah. So so that is the you know the the. How, how are your audience listening and what are they using to listen to? And actually, you, to do that head tracking, there, 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 there are kind of, there, there are latencies coming down. Latency is an issue. Latency is coming down and there are headphones. So there's a Kickstarter campaign with headphones that currently tracks headset. There are devices like these Rondo things, which is, do a reasonable job of tracking um, head rotation. Um, and you know that, that that's a that's a technology that that is going to catch up. It's not a fundamental. It's not like the physical problem that we have of people interfering with with radio frequencies that just that isn't going to get could better. But there's a difference with ambisonics because you you can rotate the field and manipulate the field with fairly simple processing. And yeah, that can be mapped to head tracking. Probably why yeah. a lot of people are, they want a binaural output. But underlying it's a lot of ambisonics that's then finally turned into. Do it in third order. Do it in third order amping or higher, and then send the 16 tracks out and do the binaural de- the binaural encoding relative to the. Yeah, sorry. Um, use higher order ambi and then send that out as your data stream and then decode for whatever the head movement is at the point, and then you could have the binaural tracking because you've got the full spherical sound. Well, I mean, Mike Gerson used to say you needed over a thousand figures of eight to, to get it right. Or a, 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 well, yeah, a, thou, a thousand. I, I'm just using that euphemistically. But, you know, do you really need to encode it from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz accurately for the size of a human head? And I would argue, no, you don't. What you need is enough to fool the brain. Anyway, thank you. I've said it. Okay, well, thank you very much, Tony. Um, I uh, 
I found that fascinating and I hope you all enjoyed it too. So if you'd like to thank Tony in the traditional way.